This episode was recorded and produced on Lishan Ohlone land. We give our great respect to the indigenous peoples of this land and the surrounding areas, and to the indigenous peoples of all the lands that you are joining us from. To learn more about how you can support Lishan Ohlone land rematriation, please read the information in our video description below. Chromithica is part of the Rainbow Roll Network, an event-focused cooperative network for LGBTQIA-led, creator-owned actual play shows. To learn more about Rainbow Roll Network shows, please visit rainbowroll.network. To listen to our show in podcast form, find us on any major podcast app or visit our website at chromithica.com. Content notices for this episode include alcohol use, Combat violence, including violence toward an awakened animal as part of combat. Strong language. everyone! Welcome to Chromythica! I am your GM, Esther Wallace, and I use she and they pronouns, and I'm so happy to have all of you wonderful players and dear friends here again, and I'm so happy to have you, our audience here. Welcome to our story and this time together. I am going to ask the cast to go around and introduce themselves and their characters as we usually do, everybody's names, pronouns, and if there's something you're excited about for our story today or your character generally. Hi, I'm David. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be playing Umar Party's gnome sorcerer, who's polygender and use any combination of she, him, or they pronouns, and Um's pseudo-dragon familiar Nami, who uses he, him pronouns. And I'm excited to learn more about King DTF. Hi, I'm Alex. I use they, them pronouns. I'll be playing Professor Z, our party's inventor, and his contraption buster, which is a clanging pile of pots and pans that explodes occasionally. And I, too, am excited to learn more about the king, especially because I believe I'm off in the woods and will learn nothing about the king in the game. So. It's going to be great. I'm Justin. I use he, him pronouns, and I play our canine barbarian, Ember, who also uses he, him pronouns. I am excited for Ember to discover that his friends are not coming. <laughs> I'm Feruz. I use she and they pronouns. I play Temerity Vane our rogue who uses he and him pronouns and i too am very excited about king dtf and seeing what else is going on with my homie here awesome i forgot to say at the top we are a pathfinder 2e actual play which is very important for me to note if you're familiar with the system awesome if you're not also awesome you don't need to know anything about it to hopefully follow along and enjoy our story. So we have a tradition in Chromithica of asking a warm-up question before every game to help ourselves get into character and into the world of the story. Today's warm-up question is, 
Tell us about a time your character took a risk in order to achieve a dream or goal. What were the consequences and or payoffs of that risk? Well, my cousin Zorzi, she's my best friend. We grew up together, right? We, we've been thick as thieves for our whole lives. And well, you know, I'm actually a thief now, but that's neither here nor there. So when we were very young, we made, we made an oath to one another to always look out for each other and that if anybody fucked with one of us, they fucked with both of us. And so it, we take it upon ourselves as a very sacred duty to fulfill this for one another where we can. So we keep what maybe you could call a ledger and every time somebody say inconveniences Zorzi in such a fashion that she believes they belong on the list or you know if they like really truly fuck her over there's there's levels to it you know so anyway one time I was in a city I was doing some work like you do and when I was wrapping up for the evening you know I'm staying in this this lovely place it's like right in the the main thoroughfare of town I, I can look at, out the window at all of the lights and the people and it's just wonderful. But you know, I'm wrapping up for the night and I look into my journal and I realize, wait, there's somebody in this city. And so I take it upon myself to perform my sacred duty, right? But so the thing is, the person, they had this like big estate and it was right across the street from where I'm staying. And well, in that moment, to me, it seemed like there's like a big party going on. So I can't just like go in through the door. Everybody's gonna see me. Everybody's gonna be like, oh, who's this? I'm very charming. So I think to myself, the best thing that you can do, you can clear this man. You can take a running leap and you can totally make this. And so, I took a running leap and you know ultimately it worked out because while I didn't I didn't make the landing that I hoped that I would make I did you know like I almost did and so the whole the like what's it called a trellis I don't know it all came down it was a great expense I'm sure for them to like repair this and it was a big embarrassment for them so even though I didn't like technically it wasn't exactly what I planned to do you know I was gonna go inside the house and see what's what and maybe take a couple of things and send her a present but I, I sent her the like newspaper clipping for the next day and it was much it was a much better present no problem so you know it was a risk but the reward even though I broke my ankle the reward it was worth it for Ember, this was before the time I first spoke. I can't remember much of that time, but I was lost once, and I smelled something that smelled like fire, and it felt like home and so i stumbled upon a large clearing where there was a dragon much larger than me but it seemed friendly and so i bit the dragon's tail and this was many years before i i met the wild master but then this became my dragon master, and they were very nice. When I was finishing up my PhD in chromatic invention and curious exploration, I was sort of getting to the end of my, my dissertation and I, and I really just needed something to wow the committee. And my committee was looking a little pale. They needed, they needed something to really, really get them going. And so it was sort of the, the week before my, my big defense talk and I was finishing up the dissertation and I had sent several drafts in, but I, I, I wanted that extra pizzazz. 
So that's actually when I when I, I built Buster. I was at home the week before, furiously, furiously writing. And then I just thought, why limit a dissertation to writing? And so I gathered up various things in in my in my apartment and and welded them together and made the contraption that you see that is Buster. And it was a little bit of a risk because Buster did did catch fire several times in the kitchen, and I was a little bit worried that that wouldn't go over well with the committee. Although you never know, sometimes fire can really renew the curiosity of everybody. And so I, I walked into the dissertation, and, and Buster was with me, and to the defense, and the the committee really in, enjoyed my my talk and my discussion of all my work, and Buster was sort of in the corner making steam noises most of the time, but not really doing much. He was a little, not the most functional at that point. He sometimes had to take a big wrench to, to give his legs a whack to get him to move. And we got to the very end and one of the committee members asked a question. And to be honest, I don't even remember what the question was, but you know, there's always that one committee member who asks the really awful question and just really wants to put you in a corner. And I said, actually, I'd rather not answer this question. I'd rather have Buster do it. And I whacked Buster with a wrench and he didn't answer the question. He just fell forward and his head exploded. And the committee ran screaming out of the room. And eventually my advisor came back in and said, if you promise to take that thing away from this university and never have it here, we won't make you redo your defense. And that's how I got my PhD, and it was really worth the risk to add that sort of curious exploration in there. Don't worry, though, Buster's been much improved. Now, when he explodes, it's not just his head that goes off, it's the whole thing. I guess my biggest risk was leaving Hermea. There was a certain comfort in being protected under the mentorship of Menkare, but I guess ultimately I just needed to see what Galarian had to offer with my own eyes. Menkare used to say that as, as much as we have to gain learning from others, our scales shine brightest when we go through journeys and decide for ourselves where our story takes us. Well, on that wise note from Menkare, let's spend a moment remembering where we left things when we were last in our story. When we were last in our story, you were headed to Professor Z's home after a long fire day of investigating the secret observatory of King Drum Thornfiddle in the Aspodel foothills outside Brasselwark. As you made your way to Professor Z's home, Oom, you were feeling very worried that someone, namely your new friend Miv, knows you're carrying something. Temerity, you were tired, wanting to chill, and wondering how you became the voice of reason in the party. And you were also very curious about what was going on with the king and dragons. Professor Z, you were feeling a little frazzled on this walk and on an adrenaline high after all the day's adventures at the observatory. And Ember, you were feeling very confused in a phrase that I love, struggling with the duality of antitheticals. So you reached Professor Z's home, and after watching the spectacle of Z unlocking his own door, you made your way in to find that Z's mentor, Alcinora or Alcy Fifewinder, was waiting for you there. Alcy informed you that the king is aware you took a little jaunt into the hills earlier today. And, after all, you did give the people guarding his secret observatory your name, Z. So apparently the king is not pleased that you were trespassing the grounds of his observatory without being invited. And Alcy had to spend quite a bit of political capital to be the person to meet you in your home and ask for an explanation. She seemed very curious about what you might have learned during your brief time at the observatory, and more frustrated that you didn't glean much information about what the king might be up to there than frustrated at you for going. She also told you that the king wants to have an explicit conversation with Oom, about their purpose in bringing a dragon to the observatory. And since Professor Z, you are the only named Link with Oom, you will be called to the king's presence soon. Elsie advised you all to spend a few days out of town on a research trip, if you don't want to have that conversation. Z, you expressed some confusion about the nature of academic culture in Brasselwork. 
You just didn't understand why the king wouldn't want multidisciplinary collaboration as part of this observatory project. You said that academic culture is all about collaboration and learning together. And Elsie responded that in an ideal world, yes, it is. But the reality is that you live in Brasselwark, in Cheliax, and whatever deal the king made with House Throne places certain conditions on what everyone in Brasselwark is able to achieve. But she also expressed admiration for your idealism and told you that your belief in what you do gives her hope. You all decided to make your way into the forest to the north of Brasselwark, where Vivi Lilyfrost had indicated to Temerity that you might find companionship. You tried to make your way stealthily and unobtrusively through the city, and Professor Z and Ember, you succeeded and were not noticed by anybody in particular. Temerity and Oom, however, things did not go so smoothly for you, and you were recognized and surrounded by the city guard. You decided it would probably be better for you to accompany them to King Drum Thornfiddle than to enter into a conflict or run, so you made your way to the palace in the center of the city. Temerity, you noticed Miv trailing behind you, but you lost sight of them as you were led into the palace. You were taken to the lower levels of Drum Thornfiddle's palace, to a place that seems part theater, part art installation, part extremely comfortable place of house arrest. The lights began to dim, and you heard the turning of gears and the sound of a panel sliding open somewhere. And then, well, 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 bringing a dragon to my observatory. That's a bold move. And I intend to find out exactly what you mean by it. Temerity, this voice sounded extremely familiar to you. But as the lights were still dim, you agreed to cooperate. Upon hearing your voice, the questioning came to an abrupt stop. And when the lights were brought up again, you recognized before you, in a very fancy purple silk suit monogrammed with a crown and the initials DTF, your friend, Pringlegus Figwart. Prinkle blustered for the guards for a moment before having Oom led away to an adjacent chamber with Nami. And then the two of you began to catch up on each other's lives. Prinkle shared with you that his deal with House Thrun had allowed him to build the city he'd always dreamed of for gnome kind. He also told you the terms of his deal with House Thrun. He contracted with Abigail Thrun I to steal the astronomical research of the dragon Athervox and to build an observatory in the Aspidel foothills using information from her many notes. It so happens, to Merity, that Prinkle had asked you several decades ago to pick up some cargo for him at a drop site in the Whisperwood, where you now know Athervox lives, and deliver this cargo to a contact in the city of Igorian. Being a professional, you never asked Prinkle what exactly he asked you to pick up for him. But now you know. You carried the research of Athervox to an agent of House Thrun. After sharing your own recent adventures, you calmed Prinkle's fears about Oom and Nami, assuring him that Nami has nothing to do with Athervox, and that Ember also has nothing to do with Athervox. Prinkle, who you promised to refer to as Drum Thornfiddle in front of other people, invited you and Oom up to his study for brandy and a chat. Oom and Nami, you spent this whole time in very luxuriously apportioned separate suites. Nothing much happened, save for near the end of your time in the suite, Oom. You heard a tapping on the wall. The wall shared with another room, and then voices saying, Hello! But just then, the king's guards arrived to inform you that you were invited up to his study, and you didn't have the opportunity to investigate further. As we left things, Ember, you were feeling great. Like you did a great job at sneaking, and Temerity will be very proud of you when you meet up in the woods. Temerity, you were thrilled on multiple levels. Thrilled to see an old friend, thrilled to get gossip, and thrilled to spill your own tea. Oom, you feel cautiously confused AF. You went from almost being interrogated to being dumped in a plush room and invited up to the king's study for brandy. And you're not sure what's going on. And that is where we enter our story again. Let's actually pick up with Ember and Professor Z. 
It's been a really long day and you've made your way to the woods north of Brasselwark and north of the enclave that's called Dwarvenhold, where a large dwarf community lives. The forest is mostly deciduous trees. The pines that are kind of to the north and west will intersect with them at a particular point, but are not the kind of trees you're, you're mostly making your way through right now. It's late in the evening, so your path is lit by the stars and the moon, but no other lanterns uh, or street lights are, are on. You're in the forest. And as you began to make your way, crunch crunching on the undergrowth and hearing the sounds of small animals chittering in the night, maybe an owl hooting here or there, it will occur to you that Oom, um, Temerity, and Miv aren't catching up with you. Perhaps we should make camp and wait for Oom, um, Temerity, and Miv to, to catch up to us. I would not be surprised. Temerity is the best sneaker. So they could be close behind if we just, we just can't hear them yet. Should we try waiting for a little bit and see if they catch up? I think that would be a good idea. I have a piece of a tent. I have a stick. Tents can be made with more than one stick, but I do like this stick. I think I'll, I'll use the stick and maybe, you know, the, the tip of Buster and make a little lean-to. Okay. I think that will be the first roll of our game today. Please roll me crafting. Can I help? Y- yeah, you, you could certainly try. Let's see how it goes. Negative one in crafting. Nine. Really certain that was a critical failure. And Two Alex, you, you rolled a 13? Yeah, I rolled a 13. Tell me about your process, both of you, for trying to set up this lean-to. I was intending to take the stick and put the stick into the ground and, like, attempt to use my mouth to kind of press it into the ground to be, you know, a vertical stick because I know that tents require some capacity of verticality so so my plan was to sort of do that and then stretch the blanket between the stick and and buster and then out like in the back and and anchor it with something in the back though it sounds like maybe you know i put the stick down and started to stretch the blanket between and then ember came and took the stick back and moved it elsewhere yeah your ally takes a minus one circumstance penalty to the triggering check sorry so you you both failed at what you were trying to do, and Alex didn't critically fail with Ember's aid, but this lean-to is going to be not the easiest thing to construct. Like, I'm picturing Ember just trying to, like, jam this stick into the ground, but you're hitting a rock, and Z, you're, like, convinced that it's gonna work, and you turn your back and have something rigged onto Buster, and then Ember moves it and everything falls down, and it happens, like, three times in a row till you're both a little tangled in everything, and then you're just sitting there panting, sweating, a little dirt-covered. How are you feeling? This well, does not look like a tent. Maybe we should try to make dinner first, and then we can worry about the tent later. I can hunt for food. Can I attempt to hunt for food? You certainly can. Roll survival. Oh my. Seven. Would you like to hero point that? I'm not wasting a hero point on getting food. (laughs) We're just going to fail at camping. (laughs) We're just going to fail at camping. I'm gonna I'm gonna go searching for like things that I know are good to eat, like squirrels and like berry bushes. I think I'm going to find a small creek and get very distracted. Okay, sounds good. Just play around in the creek for an hour. You splash around in the creek, getting very wet, possibly having a couple crawdads like come out and cling onto your fur if you upset a rock or or two, and they're very very interesting things. It's a Can good I eat hour. the crawdads? Sure. Do you want to? I would. Sure. Okay, they're going to be a little crunchy. That's fine. All right. You you eat about two crawdads. They're they're slow crawdads. They don't scuttle away very quickly. They they crunch. One of them might like get your tongue a little bit, but it's probably still worth it. Definitely so, worth it. for those who may not know, 
what I offered for Justin to do in, in using a hero point. Hero points are something that you can opt to use in the Pathfinder system that allow you to re-roll a check or in our house rules, roll a check with advantage, take an action outside of your turn in combat or a skill challenge, come back from the brink of dying, which is not a house rule, that's an official rule. And as another house rule, do something really, really, really cool that is improbable, but not impossible. So when I ask the folks if they would like to spend a hero point, that's what I'm asking and prompting about. So you're splashing around in the creek. Z, what are you doing? So I am going to be in the process of converting Buster into an oven because I would like to, I don't know, bake some dinner. And so what you can imagine is that I have opened up the front of Buster and at least up to my waist is sort of inside chucking camping gear out of Buster and making a lot of noise with like my sort of butt and legs sticking out, standing on a stool as I like, you know, grab stuff and check a sleeping bag out and check a pot out and check some food out. And I'm just making a big pile behind me as I try to sort of clear out Buster's insides. Okay. Okay. So you're making a lot of noise, making a pile of metal objects, it sounds like, or, or objects that, and some of them are Objects. Metal? Yeah. Okay. All of our possessions. Yeah. All of your possessions that you brought. All right. All right. Are you actively trying to convert Buster into an oven during this hour? Yes. My intention okay. is that when I'm done with this, I've cleared out all of his insides and because he produces a lot of steam and heat that he is effectively an oven. So first roll another crafting check. Okay. And what did you get? I rolled a 27. All right. You know, the lean-to totally failed, but it's like you're spurred on in your heart by that failure to do this thing. And maybe memories of your, your dissertation defense come back to you in this moment. And you're like, sometimes you just got to change things up and challenge the narrative of the ordinary. And you make a ton of noise while doing it, but you convert Buster into a pretty good oven. Like if you had a pizza stone, you could pop it right on in there and make a really good pizza. It's remarkable what you're able to achieve. Like really remarkable. Do you want to describe what it looks like or any, any way you feel about that? Uh, so what it looks like in the end is sort of the Buster's torso was always a bit of a like wood fired stove anyways. So it's more like you've sort of tipped the top of Buster's head off so that there's like a chimney going on sort of through what is effectively Buster's, you know, ears producing smoke. And then you've got the, the front doors of a like wood fired stove with a spot inside where you can cook some things. Maybe I've packed some, some flour and so we can make some bread or something in, in the oven. And it's one of those, like, you can see the sort of like fire, the like nice wood coals off to one side, heating it up. And because Buster produces a lot of steam, it naturally gets a lot of steam in there, which gets a lot of moisture in the oven, which is really important for getting that nice golden brown crust on the outside of your, your bread. Oh, that sounds amazing. So the second thing I need you to roll is a perception check secretly, please. Both of us are, are just Professor Z. This will be at about the end of an hour or so. So if you are coming back to Professor Z's location about this time, yeah, you could... You could roll one as well. All right. So you've made your way good ways into the forest. And actually, you've stopped at a point where the undergrowth opens up to a bit of a glade. Professor Z, you might actually have been aware of this place as a kind of a nestled nook that folks will gather at for summer bonfires and such. If you've never been there yourself, you're familiar with such a place in the North Forest and you've wandered around and wound up there, luckily. In the middle of the glade, there are several like downed logs that uh, are old and are sort of arranged around a circular spot of ground that looks like it's had many fires built on it. Like there's no grass that really grows there. It looks like a burned circular ring and there's some remnants of like ash and burn sticks in the middle of this thing. And so the logs are arranged around it and circular and there's old tree stumps that are also dotted around as seats, you might imagine. There are pine trees off to the northwest side, a stand of pine that are meeting the rest of the like more deciduous trees. And on the far side of the glade off to the north, there are beautiful, colorful flowers that are a sea of 
blues and greens and purple pinks. They all look very, very similar to one another, and yet the coloration is different. And there are other plants that kind of are darting up in the middle of some of these collections of flowers, shrubs that are giving way to other tall flowering plants, little groves of mushrooms. It's, it's really very interesting. Ember, this just seems like a pretty place to you, somewhere that you, you may have come with Oriana from time to time, but there's nothing remarkable. However, Professor Z, your eyes are very sharp, and perhaps it seems a little odd to you that Um and Temerity and Miv haven't arrived yet. Perhaps you're on the lookout, and you see what at first appears to be a little shadow darting from log to log, and you hear a scuffling noise and little like, <laughs> and then you see a very interesting creature indeed. It seems to go on all fours, though it can stand up and sort of waddle from side to side until it goes on all fours again. It does seem to have hands, but hands that also function very well as able to, to run on the ground. And it has long blue gray hair that it's like coating the sides of its body from its head on down its back. It, it appears to be dressed in some sort of fabric garment, but it's the weave is a little difficult for you to make out. And its skin is like a dark slate gray. And you can actually hear it sort of burbling to itself in something that sounds like it has the cadence of a language, though I don't believe it's a language you speak. Can you remind me which languages you speak? Common, gnome, sylvan, draconic, elven, dwarven, and undercommon. You do understand. Wow, I forgot oh. you spoke undercommon. So you do understand what it says. And it's, it's saying to itself, <laughs> shinies. Shinies, very shinies. Hmm, maybe we can get it to give us the shinies. Maybe we makes friends with it, or maybe we we takes them. <laughs> it thinks it's being like very, very stealthy. But you rolled really, really, really well. Hi, Gollum. Like <laughs> I honestly didn't mean for it to have a Gollum voice, and then I was like, well, I guess this is where we're going. Okay, it's Gollum. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, what would you like? I to think, do? since I understand it's undercommon, and maybe my undercommon, like you know, I've learned many languages as, a, as an academic, so my sort of informal, out in the woods undercommon may be a little bit stilted. But I think I'll I'll say, you there, what are you doing? It looks up, startled, and you see that it has like, I believe three eyes, like two eyes, one in the middle of its forehead, or maybe like two and one here. Let's, let's say two up here and one down here, like towards the nose. And it says, I'm gonna change its voice. This is exciting, y'all. I didn't know you could hear me. You're making a kind of a racket. And what are you talking about? Well, I was just coming by and I, I saw that you had a, a shinies. I like shiny things. Might we be able to make a trade? What are you proposing to trade? Many things. What, what is it you want? Well, I, I'm a bit of an adventurer and I, I kind of like shiny things and I like new things. What do you what do you have that's novel and interesting, maybe? And what do you want? They're gonna root around in their little pocket for a moment and put their hands into like a few different corners of their garments and then excitedly hold their hands out to you and there's gonna be just a jumble of objects like a few rocks that are shot through with really interesting veins of other kinds of rocks but they don't immediately strike you as anything precious there will probably be a few gold coins in there which are valuable like three gold maybe two silver and there will be some moss a little bit of leathery substance you're not sure what it is odds and ends trinkets the gold seems to be the most valuable thing there well what do you want 
What is this round thing here? I want round fire. Well, you can't have you can't have all of Buster. Buster's Buster's my my invention. I gotta keep Buster. He comes over, going up and down, and kind of looking around the glade and looking up a couple times, and then will settle himself by your things and begin to go through them. Like think very Yoda in in The Empire Strikes Back, going through all of Luke's mm. stuff, like. <laughs> but with kind of a, a weird southern accent because I didn't decide on this character's voice properly beforehand. <laughs> so walk me through some of the specifically metal things you might have there. So various tools, so like wrenches and screwdrivers and drill bits, like a frying pan, like sort of tent pegs or stakes, that kind of thing. What else? Maybe a chain and some joints and like two axles connected to each other, a couple pieces of pipe, lots of odds and ends like that. I think he is going to exclaim, ah, over the chain, and then gather three drill bits, two joints, and the frying pan, and just look in excitement over all of them and say, all this, all this, how much for all of this? I think I need the frying pan. How am I going to cook? He makes a displeased face and hisses at you and actually shows some very, very sharp pointed teeth. I want this. Ember, it's about this time that you stop fondly reminiscing about the, the creek and your time with Oriana and notice this creature in Professor Z and specifically the creature's sharp teeth. What does this creature smell like? That's a great question. I am actually looking to see if they give me any canonical information on what this creature might smell like. So one moment. I don't think there is, but if there is, I'm happy to go. I think I know, know what that. it is. Do you? I have, a, I have a guess. You actually probably do. It wouldn't surprise yeah. me. I'm going to say it smells little metallic, little like mm -hmm. faint din of, of metal, and like the scent of petrichor that you got a couple of times wandering through the city in the past few days. Not the exact same thing, but there's something like the earth after a heavy rain that smells mm -hmm. really deep, and then a little bit of metallicness thrown in. Does earth, not smell earth like is... smoke, yeah. fire, or death. Right. Well, Earth is one of the bad people's smells, but not by itself. It needs more yeah. stuff to be a bad person's smell. So then Ember will approach from behind, probably, and will say, I found a creek. You found a, a person. He's trying to make a trade with me, but I don't know. Like, we need our frying pan. Why? To cook things. I can cook things. Well, yeah, but like the frying pan is important. The frying pan is important. Then we keep the frying pan. Yeah, let's keep the frying pan. But like the joints and the screws and the the drill bits, yeah, we could trade those. I'll I'll trade those for, you know, and I'll I'll like point to like a couple of the rocks he had and the gold pieces. He seems completely disinterested in Ember, that Ember is an animal who is speaking. He just, like, hisses again at both of you. <sighs> I want this. Look, if you're going to be rude, then I'm going to have to ask you to put down my stuff and skedaddle. I was making dinner here. Roll to Ember, Ember will... Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> oh, oh. What was, it? What was Ember going to do? What side of the frying pan is this creature holding? The handle. <laughs> okay, I kind of figured. Uh, I would like to, it's just harder for me to grab the not handle part of the frying pan. So I have to attempt to grab the round part of the frying pan with my face. Okay. I suppose Am I still that's... rolling diplomacy or have we now ended the diplomatic part of this? You can roll, not yet. You can roll diplomacy and Ember, you can roll athletics. Thievery? Sure. 
I think it should be <laughs> athletics. And that would make sense to me. Kind of like a grapple. It's sort of like a disarm. I'm good at that. 20. Dirty oh. 20. Dirty, okay. 20. <laughs> and actually, Alex, can you roll it secretly for me? Oh, okay. Ember, you do succeed in just yanking this thing right out of his hands. Sweet. Which he does not seem too pleased about. He just hisses more and actually, like, starts to move towards you and, like, growl, like, Can I, uh, change my grip so that I'm- He turns back towards Professor Z and seems to listen for a moment and he's like, Maybe, maybe. There's something else I could want. Very rude of this one to take it from me. But well, it wasn't yours. Doesn't seem to take that in at all. But we'll offer you one rock and one piece of gold for the drill bits, the joint, and the chain. I'll do that if you give me deal. back the joint. <laughs> it's probably a good deal, I guess. It, and you want back the chain, Alex? No, the joint. The joint. Both or just one? Just one. I want something else if I give this back. Uh. Oh, you know what's relevant? What's relevant? What's relevant? The ring, because it would be visible. <laughs> I really. Sorry to point it out. It's okay. Let's let's <laughs> actually. I'll roll something really quick. Ember's Zeke, ring that he carries Zeke around his neck. Moment. Yeah, Ember's Ember's ring, Mira's ring, Oriana's ring. I guess the light does catch on the ring. The starlight reflects, and as he is considering this offer from Professor Z, he sees it. And his eyes, his three eyes, go very wide. Ah. I want that. This shiny around his neck. A word of advice. I'm interested in bartering because I am curious about things. The dog... A little temperamental. Dog. I'm saying it all in undercommon, so I don't know. That... Okay. I certainly yeah, don't. Yeah, Ember, speak you would just hear like a series of odd noises that I leave it up to you if you think it's language or not. But Professor Z and this creature are like talking to each other in a way that you do not understand at all. Cool. I'm gonna try to just for fun get the frying pan turned around in my mouth so I can hold the handle. You do that with some maneuvering while while this creature is like pointing at your neck and its eyes are going wide and it's slowly like crawling towards you. Now, now, I just, I just don't think, I, I think you want to trade with me, not the dog. I am getting impatient. I could stop trading with you at all and call in my friend. Yes, Colin, my friend. We take it from you after we kill you. <laughs> he shows you his teeth. I'm going to put my hand on like a short sword, my short sword, and say, I think this dealing is done and you should leave. He just looks at you and grins, and then like sticks a, a small hand with long claws, long, really long claws, in his mouth and does like a, a wolf whistle, and nothing happens immediately. Let's roll initiative. He is now completely like looking at this ring fixated on it, and seems like he's gonna do anything yeah. he can. Let me take you to the map. There is a map for this. And you can drag yourself onto it. All right, Ember, you are up first. What would you like to do? This being is brandishing his teeth at you and just hissing and laughing. <laughs> I, 
I get the sense that this is hostile with that yes. perception roll. Okay, then I'm just going to attack. Let's do I mean I don't I don't have enough hit points to be careful about this to be honest. <laughs> so I'm going to rage. He um, seems like his mood has changed pretty quickly and since it came to him that he could just kill you both and take all your stuff, he seems good doing that. Okay. I will rage. I'm going to hop around behind him with the hope that I can flank and I will do that. That'll just be stride. And then it's gonna be a wolf jaws attack. That's pretty good, 27 oh. to hit. Yeah, if only Miv had been there, you're so close to a crit. Yeah, that hits. Okay, so then that is 13 points of piercing damage from my wolf jaws attack as Ember yeah. begins like, gives like a low growl and his, his fur begins to almost like smoke as he bounds around behind this creature and then snaps back with his jaws. It hisses in pain and kind of gives a low, ah! And then just giggles and like, <laughs> she'll be here in a moment. And oh, just, just giggles. I don't like that. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Zia, you're up. Okay, so Ember's wolf shot. Okay, I'm gonna step forward and slash with my short sword. Okay. Yeah. And what did you roll? I rolled a 23. Nice. Awesome. That also hits. And did slightly less damage than Ember, though, in that I only did one damage. So you you did a total of one damage, but yes, every little beautiful. bit helps. <laughs> it's, I'm really here to contribute. It, it, you know, it looks considerably less well than it was. He was. And now it is his turn. And... Ember, he is just going to turn right around and bite you right back, and we will see how that goes. 19. That definitely hits. Does not critically hit, right? No. He also rolled very poorly for damage and will uh, do two damage, and... Oh, that doesn't even take out my temporary hit point. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now he is going to spend the rest of his action casting a spell he's gonna cast grease and actually he's just gonna cast it at you in your direction ember okay can can you as my rules paralegal remind me if you have to roll a reflex save right now or on your next turn it would depend on i don't know the rules for grease the area effect is solid red and the area is covered with grease each creature standing on the greasy surface must succeed at a reflex save or an acrobatics check against your spell dc or fall prone creatures using an action to move onto the greasy surface during the spell's duration must attempt either a reflex save or an acrobatics checks to balance a creature that steps or crawls doesn't have to attempt a check or save okay so it sounds like so but are you you said targeting me yeah oh, at like a range of 30 feet yeah yeah, yeah, so just uh, but so, area. Yeah. So it, it sounds like I need to make the save now. Okay, make that save now. 23. That's not bad. That's almost certainly going to succeed. And yeah, that succeeds. Well done. Love it if the love it if the grease kind of just like burned up around him. I actually, yeah, let's go with that. Like he casts grease and it just all catches fire from Ember's innate heat and burns up. It's amazing. All right, Ember, it is now your turn again. Cool. Well, I'm definitely gonna start with a bite. Wolf Jaws. That is a 20 to hit. That does hit. 10 points of piercing damage. All right. Do I risk the second attack? Probably, I don't have a lot of other good things to do. Okay, so I'll do the second attack. Is that really? Yep, that's natural yeah. too. That hero does not point. Hit. Spend my first hero point, um, and I am going to use a physical die. Betrayed. <laughs> Utterly betrayed. Oh no. So that is a weapon. Does not hit. Curses. Yeah. And then you have one action left. I do have an action left. Um, I would like to use intimidating glare. Okay, go for it. 
to demoralize this creature. The physical die did do better, so I'm gonna go with that. Betrayed, utterly betrayed. Oh, no. Ten. Ten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and remind me. It gives yeah. them the frightened condition if I succeed, but I yeah. don't think I did. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't think you did. I'm sorry. No, no worries. Okay. All right. So your first attack did hit for a lot of damage, and he does seem to be in pain. But you notice he's actually beginning to look up at this guy now and just say, Any moment, any moment. Professor Z, it's your turn. I am going to, with my first action, throw my weapons and gadgetry into overdrive, especially because all of my tools and whatnot are scattered around the place. So I feel like, you know, this looks like maybe I like take the short sword and pick up a drill crank thing and attach it to it. So now it's like spinning around kind of thing. And on the other end, I like attach a like screwdriver or something else that's gonna whack into him. So like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go for just how much can I make this into a preposterous weapon? So I think I do a crafting check to awesome. see if I get things into overdrive. So okay. where's my crafting? I rolled an 18. So you succeed. All right. Now, that was one action, right? Yes. So now I'm going to spend a hero point to attack with advantage with my short sword contraption. Okay, go for it. All right. 22. That was pretty right. good, though. That was pretty good. 22 hits, okay. and you deal five piercing damage. Does your overdrive give you anything in addition to that? Your strikes deal additional damage equal to your intelligence modifier for one minute. Oh. Ooh. Is your intelligence modifier three? Four. Four. All right. Nice. So nine, nine damage total. He is looking incredibly rough right now. Can I also try to stab him with my dagger? Absolutely. You'll take a penalty because it's your second attack, but you totally can. Is a dagger an agile weapon? I believe so. I yeah. You take a little less of a penalty yeah. than you normally would, so. Four and seven. I think five. I. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it might be worth it. I would encourage you to try it if you want to. I'm yeah. going to try I mean, it. You could, also, you could also just do it with the short sword again, right? Oh, can I? Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll yeah. do it with the short sword again. It's got some okay. momentum to it. Go for it. Well, not that not. much momentum, though. <laughs> Natural one. Almost rendered this creature unconscious, and in your pride at your growing prowess as a warrior, you swing totally wide and leave him open to lurch toward Ember with another bite attack as his first action. And he is just gonna go for it. And 20 hits you, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Definitely, definitely hits me. For eight damage. Kate, we're out of temporary hit points now. All right. And now he is going to try clawing you twice. Just one right after the other, and he's going to take a series okay. of penalties. His first one, he rolled a natural one, so it definitely doesn't hit. And his second, he rolled a 21, which does hit. That hits. That definitely yeah. hits. For seven slashing damage. Okay. How are you doing? I have three hit points. Well, in exciting news, someone else is now going to appear in the sky above you. You both see this hovering wings, and, and you know the way like birds have a very specific flight pattern where you can kind of see the gentle flapping of wings, and like bats tend to hover in really weird ways and kind of like jump around. Yeah, this looks like a, a giant bat, and as this little dude is like kind of bleeding out on the ground after clawing Ember. He looks up and he just starts laughing like, <laughs> and you see a giant bat appear above the trees at the edge of this glade. The small creature who can speak under common is just like, ah, she's here, she's here. I knew she'd come when I called and let's see how she does. 14, no. However, Fortunately for the two of you, you also hear a rustling kind of at the opposite corner of the glade over here. And 
you're gonna see another figure step out into the moonlight. This is a gnome-sized person. Actually, you can see she is a gnome, not just gnome-sized. <laughs> it's a little difficult to say whether it's a trick of the moonlight across a glade in the middle of battle, but something that looks a little bit unusual about her at first. But she's gonna say in a very commanding voice, in, in common. Are these creatures troubling you? I'm, I'm yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> there's, there's this air of calm about her coming into a scene like this, where you might ordinarily expect someone to, to like run up to you as fast as they can, but she's just standing there, taking it in for a moment, and then she's going to calmly make her way over, which will take most of the rest of yeah, the turn, right. and, and then we'll see what happens after she gets there. The giant bat rolled pretty well, so it's gonna go ahead and go, but it is really interested in what looks like the two humanoid figures, and first of all, it's going to go up to Buster, who is like on fire and gleaming, and try to pick Buster up you get the idea that maybe it's not the most intelligent bat in the world and maybe it relies on like commands from the little creature that's like bleeding next to ember and fighting ember and without explicit commands it doesn't quite know what to do and it's going to totally fail in its attempt to pick up buster and then it becomes very annoyed and is going to try to bite buster and does a 26 hit buster's ac Buster's AC is 17. Doesn't yes, crit, that though. Yes, that does. Doesn't crit, though. It will do deal 12 points of slashing damage to Buster's. Like, this metal, it's like, you know, the nails on a chalkboard, like, as the teeth kind of go in. And then it is going to turn towards Professor Z, and because it just sees so much going on, it is going to try to attack you with its wings. Doesn't Buster but, only have 10 HP? Yeah, well, that's a question I have. Would Buster have only had 10 HP? Because, like, Buster, we've reconfigured, we've worked on Buster. Yeah, I, I think I think Buster probably would be slightly improved. Okay. Does it I don't know how Buster improves. In, does it easily tell you in Buster's character sheet the rules of repair? We haven't had a sit-down since the observatory, not really. That's true. But like I did just spend a while like reconfiguring. That's true. Yeah, Buster. you were just working. You you, you were reconfiguring Buster, um, and that was like a crafting check on Buster. I don't know if that doesn't well. repair Buster, then I think Buster is dead. I will say that you got Buster up to like twenty HP. Okay, so Buster has eight HP left. Great, real good. And I believe that the wing strike is going to miss you because with the penalty, it will have rolled a ten. Miss. Z. Miss Z, yeah. Is your AC lower than 10? My AC is not lower than 10, so... Really impressive if your AC was lower than 10. All right, yeah, it no, is that is me. It's Ember's turn again. Okay, Ember is going to attempt to finish off of this creature with one more Wolf Jaws attack. I'm not using a hero point because I need to save it. I assume that even with flanking, that my 11 will not hit. Yeah, I won't. I'm sorry. Oh, do I spend? I'm betrayed by my dice. I have rolled a two, a three, and a four. It would be better for me to use a hero point and re-roll than it would to try the second attack. So I'll spend another hero point. I think I should have had the bat move instead of attack. I forgot where I put okay. the bat. Let's just say the bat did no damage to Buster. It should have had a move action. So it's. Erase that damage. It failed. <laughs> My bad. I feel like that's good anyways, because Buster right now is in oven mode and so is kind of hot. So yeah. I feel like trying to damage a hot iron thing like should have some consequences for the bat too. I was gonna say, with my hero point reroll, it was a 26 to hit. Does that happen to crit because we're flanking? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Oh well, Sorry. 16 points of damage. Oh yeah, you have thoroughly 
thoroughly rendered this creature down. Give us a visual. So my plan is, which I would like to spend more actions on my turn to do, is that I want to grab this creature by the, let's say by the neck. And I want to just like clamp down with my jaws and then kind of fling it into the bat. Ooh, all right. Let's do it. So I assume that would be like an athletics check. Athletics, I have yeah. no idea. Or like a ranged attack roll. I have no idea. Let's just do a ranged attack roll. I like that one. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be my second attack. Which which dice should I let betray me or should I go get other dice? I'm going to use my physical dice. I spent so much okay. money on them. Okay. Yes. I am not proficient in whatever this creature is. I don't believe that you are. <laughs> yeah, that's no, it's not really a question. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to add my dex then. 16. Minus 5. Multiple attack penalty. 11. You do fling this creature at the bat, and it goes wide and lands very softly in this field of flowers over here, where we will mark it, and we will mark it with a little icon that is out of combat. And now I shall remove it from the turn order. All right, Professor Z. I assume, yeah, I assume it's the rest of my turn. Yeah. Stab the bat. Okay. Yeah, why not? Let's stab the bat. Stab the bat. Before I stab the bat, can I, because like all of our stuff is around us, right? Yes. What if I tried to use searing restoration by throwing something that's going to explode at Ember? Okay. I'm into Give it. Give Ember Let's... a few more hit points. If, if you want to do it, I'm very into it. Let's go for it. I don't even think, is there, a, it doesn't say there's a check for it. Yeah, I, I don't think there is a check. I think it's just a one action action. So you can totally yeah. do that. Yeah. So basically, I think I'm just cauterizing whatever wounds I can reach on, on Ember real quick. All right. Mm -hmm. And you can restore 2d4 hit points. It has to be an adjacent living creature, I see. Okay, so I'm just gonna roll okay, two D4 seven. then. Seven. seven. That brings me up to double digits. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. I thought that was a good idea. All right, now we stabby stabby batty batty. Okay. We hero point stabby stabby batty batty. Alex rolled a natural one. Better. Oh, if we That's could roll above a five, that would be great. That is going to hit, and that's very exciting. And you will deal a total of three damage. Don't I get to deal an extra yeah, four damage though? Because I'm oh, still oh, in overdrive. You, yeah, you do. So it's seven, seven damage. Seven damage. Not bad. All right. Cool. And then third action. Let's just try stabbing again. Like this totally isn't okay. going to work, but let's try it. Natural twenty. Natural twenty. It's a natural twenty. Yeah. So that actually is going to change things a bit. Okay. So you critically hit this thing. I rolled a natural twenty, so I critically hit. I have a short sword which has been turned into a whirligig short sword that has a whole bunch of contraptions on it. So my short sword, I rolled a five on the damage die, plus an extra four for my short sword being in overdrive. So this thing's really, it's a nine, you know, going full shredder mode and it crits. So we double that to get to 18 damage total. Basically, awesome. my short sword has turned into, you know, like a, a, a chainsaw blender. <laughs> That's a beautiful visual. So you just like shred through these wings, creating many holes, and this bat is like shrieking and can barely stay aloft. And it looks really bad. It looks really bad. So the person who has made her way across the clearing is going to spend her first moments of her turn just looking around and saying, it looks like you have things in hand. Do you need my aid? I think I think Professor Z is going to be like, well, what we're being attacked. What is this thing? Like, still not. We're not done fighting. She says it's a giant bat. Well, maybe we could. You could help us get rid of it. I will see what I can do, and she will roll her first attack, and that will hit and deal eleven points of bludgeoning damage, which will render this bat unconscious. She takes a staff that she's carrying in both hands and just whack, like whacks it, and the bat falls plump on the ground in front of you, 
and its wings like twitch a little bit and it curls up and falls totally unconscious. And this person just breathes, mm. replaces her staff. What brings you to this glade on such an exciting evening? Ember is going to kind of do the like panting kind of thing of like as the rage subsides and then it's just going to collapse into a little ball and just be like, I am done fighting today. Z is gonna say, so we're out here on a, on a research trip. Ah, so you are from the community in Brasselwark, I take it. Yes, yes, I am an a, a exalted member of the Tinkerwoods. She doesn't seem to react at all to Ember speaking. This is really interesting. Most people, many people who you've met in Brasselwork since you gained the power of speech have been a little weirded out by it, to say the least. She just comes up to you and gently touches you and says, perhaps I can aid in your healing, if you would like. I'm going to have her roll a medicine check and we'll see how she does. I'm down 24 hit points, which is a lot at level two. She's definitely... And, and I tried to blow you up, but, you know. <laughs> She's definitely going to be able to help you. She's able to heal you for 10 Sweet. hit points right now. I'm feeling much better. Thank you. That is nice. You. I know you. you... The dog? Yes. So, I'll take a second as she says this, to describe what she looks like. Now that you can see her close up, she's not like most other gnomes you tend to see, Professor Z, and, and like most other gnomes you've seen, Ember, though you have seen some people like her. She has light lavender hair and light, light blue skin, and aquamarine eyes have sort of a faded quality. All the gnomes you've seen in Brasselwork thus far have incredibly bright coloration of their skin, their hair, and their eyes. They tend to wear incredibly vibrant clothing with interesting textures and patterns. She's dressed in a pretty simple, like, linen outfit with some leather accoutrement. And it's not so much that I would describe her as having no colors at all. It's like if you've seen fabric that has been in the sun or like colored paper that has been in the sun for a long time and you can tell it used to have a really really vibrant shade of something and it still retains that it's just faded or like a rug that's been in the sun and has been walked on so much that you'd know what the weave was and you can still trace that pattern it's just the colors are, are much less intense than they were so when we say bleaching i wouldn't describe it as like like bleaching like that word might evoke, but just this like this fading of color. So you can guess that maybe a once upon a pallor. time she had like really vibrant purple hair and now it's it's a little bit of a faded lavender. Ember, you have met bleachlings before with Oriana. And you remember that Oriana was always very kind to these particular gnomes whose colors seemed less bright. And that other people around her were not always as kind. I am colorblind, just a reminder, but yes. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I think I might notice that, like, that these people are treated differently. Professor Z, you have never, ever seen someone who is undergoing the effects of the bleaching in Brasselwork or near Brasselwork. Like, this is a place where that does not happen. If you have encountered people who have bleached before or are undergoing the bleaching. They are typically treated with a great deal of fear or social awkwardness or like they are in need of help in some way. And I leave it up to you what your feelings would be, whether you would be a little bit uncomfortable in this situation, whether you don't care at all, like maybe you and your folks rolled different growing up. I leave that up to you for you to describe to us. I think Professor Z's default mode is definitely a little bit awkward and maybe a little bit overly forthright. So in this case, the awkwardness is gonna 
shine through. She continues and she says, but I know you. You, you would come with Oriana when she came to see me at my mother's. Ember. Do I remember this person? Probably have flashes of memory. She seems familiar. You, you maybe remember going with Oriana to the Lily Frost Inn and having a, a slightly younger version of this person. Maybe try to pet your ears. You remember her mother seeming worried about her and Oriana seeming kind, calm as usual. I do know you. You are nice. I am grateful. You knew my master. I did. Since she is no longer here to watch these woods, I watch them. I think she would be grateful. I'm grateful to her. I what are you watching tired. for? Ember's very tired. You may rest safely in my home tonight. Come. And she just will we'll stand up. Gather your things. I watch these woods for any who would harm them. She will gesture to the side of the clearing where there's more pine trees and there's actually a collection of logs, which you can see on the map, and some area that's clearly been felled. There is a time to take and a time to give back. If industry and the ambition of the city takes too much, I will ensure that the forest gives back. I watch for creatures like these, who perhaps those in the city are not aware of or willfully choose to ignore that they bring upon themselves. Well, I had no idea such creatures existed out here. I expect you spend much time with your studies. Well, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an, an inventor and I've been building this thing and I'm going to sort of gesture at Buster as I start to reassemble Buster and put bits back in there and shove, like, the tent in there and all that. He is Professor Z is very smart. He knows many words. I am sure that he is quite intelligent, and he does know many words. Make haste. I would not wish the two of you to need to fight any more tonight. It seems that you have been through a lot. She looks at Ember. Maybe maybe a little bit more was going on with you than that particular fight. You may stay in my home tonight. And once you're done gathering up your things, she'll lead you through the forest. Not exactly along a path at first, though you will come to one that is clearly well-worn by her. And you will come across a charming little hut that's like made halfway out of a living tree and branches which seem to have been called up from the ground to make some of the walls and halfway out of constructed walls that are made of wood and it has a a mossy mossy roof with a little chimney and she will get a fire going so it's it's quite comfortable in there and she'll have a bed for herself and will offer to make you beds of moss gathered from the nearby woods if you so so choose or if you brought along a bedroll you can like lay it down in her little one room cabin i think ember is just gonna immediately curl up next to the fire thank you for letting us use your home i didn't realize there were so many uh strange things out in these woods there are and more and more are coming from the mountains. Fascinating. Perhaps in the morning we will discuss further. You are in need of rest. Indeed. Lay out my bedroll. Let's leave y'all there for the night and let's go to break. Come back and visit Temerity and Oom and King DTF.
Welcome back, everyone. We are going to pick back up with Um and Temerity and Nami and King DTF in his study where you all are gathering to chat over Brandy. You will be led through corridors that are incredibly brightly painted. Like some are entirely one color walls, like a bright yellow, and then like shocking blue trim, like blue molding or whatever. And some are like polka dotted walls or striped or muraled all over. There are like silk curtains and curtains made of velvets and those cornice boards with tassels everywhere. There's so much color and texture to the build of this place. There are winding corridors and you get glimpses of circular rooms and square rooms and rooms that are all kind of polygon shaped and corridors that just abruptly end or suddenly there's a huge balcony in front of you. It's like the entire city of Brasselwark boiled down into a palace, but eventually you will make it to a particularly resplendent wing and there's some large ornately carved oak doors which will be pushed open by either the king himself or the guards, and you will find a lavishly appointed study. There are big squashy couches for gnomes and big squashy chairs for humans. They are also like covered in rich velvets, like bright pink and yellow and orange. Some of them are done up in silk. Some of them are patterned fabrics that look very, very expensive. And like there's a mural on one wall that kind of complements the one you saw in the lower part of the the palace, I suppose we could say. The, the, nice, the nice house arrest portion. He doesn't like to call it a dungeon and it doesn't feel a lot like a dungeon, even though that's kind of what it is. But it's this like mural of a place that is very bright and colorful and many, many strange creatures. And then a hard break and some place that looks more like the world you're used to and, and ordinary things just on one wall. The others are like a mixture of, again, like stripes and polka dots and like maybe even a paisley pattern. And I'm not sure if people can hear my dog walking in the background, but we'll pretend that it's Ember walking around a cottage and that's like echoing into our, our story. Anyway, there's a large fireplace made out of gray stones with a roaring fire and many different like awards on this fireplace that are displayed like to King Drum Thornfiddle on behalf of the Scholarium for your generosity, for your vision, and for your collaboration with us in making this city such a success and these trophies and plaques he seems to display with a great amount of pride. And like there's very, very plush carpeting as well, woven carpets that have all sorts of bright and glorious patterns. There's a noted lack of any draconic figures in any of this scenery, and you might notice that given the whole series of conversations you've had. He will sit himself down into a large, squashy, purple chair by the fire and say, do sit down, do sit down, and, and make yourselves at home. And. Temerity, he'll gesture to you, and then when Um, you come in with Nami a few moments later, he will say the same to you. May I, may I get you some brandy or something less alcoholic to drink? We have many options. I'll have whatever you're having. Likewise. He'll pour this brandy into very, very fine crystal glasses and hand you each one. Does your, um, dragon drink? Yes, but not as much or he'll get snippety. I'm, um, sorry we got off to the bit of a rough start earlier. I, um, well, I didn't know that you were an acquaintance of Temerity's, and Temerity and I, we go back, you could say, and I'm willing to give you another shot on Temerity's good word. I am King Drum Thornfiddle of Brasselwark. Welcome to my city. I believe your name is Oom and Nami, was it? Nami will nod. <laughs> He looks at Nami a little suspiciously, but will say, It's nice to meet you. Are there any questions I can answer for you about all of this? 
I wouldn't even know where to begin. I mean, how do you two know each other? Well, Temerity and I, we used to work together. Isn't that right, Temerity? That's right. I was very fortunate to know Drum before he was a king. And, you know, we, we were maybe younger men together. We have always been in the business of inspiration, filling people's uh, heads with big ideas and the belief that they can accomplish those ideas if they really set their mind to it. You know, it's one of the things that I, um, I love about Temerity's family. I feel like your mom is that way too. She believes she can do something and she does it. And I've always found that very, very inspirational myself. So I would say that's why we get along so well. Well, you've certainly accomplished a lot getting to where you're at. How did you how did you become king of this place? Well, it's a bit of a long story. He puffs up a little bit. Temerity, you're you're sure I can trust him. Out of character, I would like to remind you that I did not say that. I know. I know. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, my king, I will remind you that I like Um, but I don't know them very well. We've we've been through a couple of scrapes together, and I think we're becoming friends. But you know, not like you and I are friends. Well, then I can't give away all the secrets of how one rises to the level of success that I have achieved. But it took. A lot of ambition, a little cunning, the willingness to do the work, to put myself in situations that other people might have found uncomfortable. But 10% work. 20% skill, 15% concentrated power of will. Yes, exactly, a classic formula. You, you know, it just took being willing to meet the right people, to schmooze with a lot of the big names until you find someone who can who can make it happen for you. And when you find them and you're in business, well, uh, it's gonna happen whether you have second or third or fifth thoughts or not. So might as well make the best of it, that's what I say. But you are from Hermea, was it? I imagine you could tell me a thing or two about how to run a, a city of enterprise, of goals, of meaning. Isn't that what Hermea is all about? So, uh, for background knowledge, I guess there was some previous knowledge that, that Mankare had disdain for how he got his kingship, but it was a bit ambiguous. Do I get the sense that that was more common knowledge? Like, that's something that he might know of Mankare's opinion from a diplomatic standpoint? I would say probably not. Probably not. There's there's never been like an envoy from Brasselwark to Hermea that you know of. So it's it's just kind of a you can roll perception to get a good guess as as from from the king's affect. Is it secret perception? Yes, or is it secret, perception? please. He's clearly so pleased with himself that anything you get from him would have to be passed through that filter. Yeah. So he's. He's just a little hard to read in that way. It's not totally clear. Well, I guess then, you know, as you as you know about Hermia, we're really just trying our best to learn how to better ourselves. So it's not that different from what you're trying to do. So I think we'd have a lot to learn from, from each other, just trying to make a society that works well for everyone. I completely agree. I completely agree. Are there anything, uh, unique going on in Hermea that really really keeps the colors bright. What do you love about living there? Well, I think there's a certain comfort to living there, but as you can see, part of what keeps the colors bright is really just journeying for yourself. And that's really what brought me here. It's trying to learn more about really just everything. Well, you have come to the right place, my friend. I mean, we have academies here that study absolutely everything you could imagine, except, I suppose, dragons. But, you could always travel to do that. But it's my dream that if you were to come live here, 
you would never have to travel again to find something that would satisfy your heart and, and keep the colors bright. I want us to have a place where we can, we can come, not have to worry about expending so much effort of our lives going here, there, and everywhere, and never being able to have a place we call our own. And that's what Brasselwark is, a place we can call our own. Well, I, I find too that the things that we don't say sometimes say a lot more. And since you're such a learned person that was interested in studying everything, I, I just can't help but wonder why dragons are so taboo here. Roll diplomacy. Uh, is that also a secret? Yes, that is also a secret. Well, you know they're large terrifying creatures and if you attract the attention of a dragon and it goes well for a while then it's it's great but we live longer than some people of other ancestries and we have to worry about hundreds of years of life if you get on the wrong side of a dragon say the wrong thing do one little thing that annoys them that get you on their bad side, then you have to worry for hundreds of years. And, and why go to the trouble of doing all that when you could just avoid it in the first place? I suppose, but I think, I mean, not all dragons are the same, or are you suggesting that all dragons look alike or behave the same way to you? Oh, no, 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 of course not, of course not. I have a lot of respect for the, and he's gonna look at Nami, the multitudinous ancestries of dragons and, and their multitudinous cultures and individualities absolutely absolutely no no offense intended uh, but sometimes it's just like you you take a, a mint from someone's home and you didn't realize that it meant that much to them the mint meant that much to them and then they just hold a grudge against you forever for taking that one little thing you know i've never felt like i wanted to put myself in a position like that so um I just find it better not to. You know what I mean? Can I secret perception that? <laughs> yeah, <just> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or you could roll society. You can tell this topic is really uncomfortable for him. It, it hits way too close to home, and whatever he talked about with temerity is still very fresh in his mind. He just, he just is babbling now, and he's trying to, like, catch himself and seem like the smooth operator he normally is, but something is rattling him. Well, in, in any case, I think that it really goes both ways. I mean, a dragon's memory is long, and you're right, they can hold grudges, but I think similarly, they can also hold a lot of gratitude, especially if they're, you know, well, well taken care of. I mean, you definitely went out of your way to make sure that, you know, as we were waiting, Nami and I were given quite comfortable um, suites, and so we definitely appreciate that. They are comfortable, aren't they? No complaints. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you! It's like, who wouldn't want to spend some time in a lavishly appointed suite with endless excellent food and reading materials and little gadgets that you can't find anywhere else in the world? I mean, half the time I want to go down there myself to take a vacation from all my kingly duties. I'm glad you think they're comfortable. No complaints? Yeah, yeah if you're gonna be detained, it might as well be in comfort. That's my thought exactly. Now, de detention is a little bit of a strong word. Ugh. I prefer to think of it as a staycation. Yeah, a forced chance to relax and... You know, uh, yes, I I'm, I'm glad you found it comfortable. Glad you found it comfortable. Um, so tell me about your, your travels. Well, I mean, there's not much to tell, really. I mean, as you can tell, you know, we haven't been traveling for that long. I'm a bit young uh, for traveling, but it's just been quite a journey, learning about different things and seeing different sights. And what's your favorite place you've been to? Well, so far here, I mean, like you said, there's just so much to do, um, so much to experience, and we were really hoping to see more of the festival of flight once it really goes underway. The festival. It is amazing. Of all the festivals we have here, this is the one that I envision just being what we're known for, the Festival of Flight. And 
what is more amazing than flying? It's captivated so many people throughout the ages. And I mean, some people can do it on their own, but a lot of us can't. And who wouldn't want to harness the power of flight and be known for that? I mean, incredible. That's why I, I try to get our airship shipyards funded all the time. Why I try to have all these centers of research have endlessly deep pockets to pull from so that we can produce things like that. And, and this year, I mean, it's gonna be really special. There's always these balloons, the airship, sometimes they crash, but everybody makes it out okay. All these demonstrations. Honestly though, this year has been a lot. I'm somewhat responsible for a lot of the planning, but there's a committee with the Scalarium and the Irie and all of these places. Endless meetings, you know how it is. If you have other things going on, it can be quite a lot. I'm glad the two of you are here because I think you may be able to help me. I want you to enjoy the festival and take a few days to really soak in everything Brasselwork has to offer, everything I can offer you. I could also use your help making sure things go off without a hitch, shall we say. The truth is, I have a few projects I need to have funded, but nothing to do with the, the place on the hill, let's call it. Other things, institutions, new centers, all that, the money doesn't just grow on trees. And I have persuaded one of the richest people in all of Absalom to attend the festival this year. And if we impress this donor, they're very mysterious, I don't know a lot about them, if we impress them, I think we could be set forever. It's very important things go well, and I'm just a little worried that they might not go well, you know? Well, I don't know much about, you know, Temerity. Like he said, you know, we just met each other, but, you know, he's good friends with, with Ember, and so if Ember trusts him, you know, I trust him too, and I think that by extension, if we can help you, and it seems like it's okay, that seems sounds good to me. Well, of course, you know, I will help you in any way I can help. Merely ask and it's yours. I owe you. But if you would be willing to help me this one more time, I would be so grateful. All right. I will have the look in my eyes of, oh yeah, you definitely owe me, bro. <laughs> but with love. I am under a tremendous amount of pressure as, as the king of Brasselwark. The vision is mine to maintain. The, the collaborations between all of these institutions and their endless politicking, mine to maintain. The relations with the house rune to maintain and well to keep everything going smoothly and to to honor the vision I have for Brasselwalk. I need to have my fingers in a few different mint jars, shall we say. Well, let's just say that maybe I, I got my fingers in a couple of different candy jars and the owners of those jars may uh, each think that I was doing them a favor and now might each want to follow up on that and it's creating a bit of a stressful situation for me i mean they are so unreasonable to deal with i would be really grateful if you could just keep your senses alert for anything strange er uh, going on around town and if there is a series of upsets that have nothing to do with the usually explosions and merry makings that, that seem sinister if you could let me know, and if you can take care of it, you will be richly, richly rewarded. Would you like to be a little bit more specific so that we are better able to aid you? Hmm. I am going to roll diplomacy for temerity secretly, but you have uh, a little bit of a bonus on this check because you are very close to King DTF. I am adding a note to King Drum Thorn Fiddle's little bio that I'm keeping, which is, has a thing for mints, and just wanted to share that with you all. Thank you. He gives another look at Oom and is like, I've always wanted to find a place to make a place our people could call home. And he's gonna gesture at the mural on one end of this room. We had a home once, thousands and thousands of years ago. We were driven from it. 
Not all of us, but a lot of us. And, well, whoever we left behind, they don't care about us. They've never tried to help us. All we have in this plane is us. Nobody else, none of these gods have ever tried to stop what can happen to us. None of these other peoples have cared enough to partner with us to figure out how to stop what can happen to us. And I just want a place where we can call home, where we can be safe from this, this thing, this bleaching that happens to us. And I, I knew early in my life that I would do anything to make that happen. And I have done, I have done hard things, but it gave me Brassel work. But in the past 60 years, I've courted investors and I've given the institutions the money and, and we're no closer to finding out what will stop the bleaching or reverse it. We can keep people's colors bright here, but we don't know anything. And I started to get a little impatient, I suppose you could say. I thought maybe I could reach out to some people who might have other perspectives on it. So I reached out to some kindred of ours who left the surface world a long time ago. You know, a, a friend of a friend of an associate's knew someone down below through some deals I didn't ask. You know temerity. It's not professional to inquire about a lot of these things. But they made some introductions and, well, we invited a couple of our, our long-lost kindred up here to Brasselwark. They don't suffer from the bleaching the way we do, and I just wanted to know why. I thought maybe they knew why. I thought maybe we could all work together in peace. Well, that went fine up to a point, but I, um, I also may have reached out to someone else, someone from the old country. Well, she has been around a long time, since like the beginning, as I understand it, and I thought that maybe she might be able to help us. She, she says she can, but she's a little demanding. <laughs> A little, little bit of a, a tight leash. I mean, I thought House Thrun was a situation, but now I'm thinking I've gotten myself into another situation. And um, I think if, if they knew I was working with her, it would be bad because they don't like her. And she wants me to deliver something on them and, and some thing I've never even heard of and I don't know what it is. And I may have some guests staying long-term downstairs, and their king may not be happy about that. It's a bit of a situation. I, I feel like if something were to happen at the festival, if all this were to come to a head, it could just be messy, and I need it to not be messy. Well, my friend, this is already fucking messy. First of all, I'll tell you that. Um, me to you, boss. When he says the old country, does that to me mean the old country, like where we come from? So he made a deal with somebody, like a different kind of deal. Um, you know, like a contract. I'm really getting the sense of like of the farmland where like the grandparents, you know, work. That's my vision of the old country. I don't know. There are just a lot of pronouns, so I think Lim's drinking more. <laughs> he he is like guzzling. Yeah, he. That was very intentionally a long rambling. Fuck, I fucked up and I can unburden myself now. So you might ask him what he means by the old country. Okay. By her. Let me ask you a question before that. He is from around wherever I'm from? Or like, where's he from? Do I know? I should know. You, you don't know where he's from. Okay. All right. Okay, then I'll just say. Well, I have several questions, but let's start with when you say someone from the old country, you know, I make certain assumptions. It kind of sounds to me like, uh, you know, like a contract and like that kind of thing. What what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? Well, when I say the old country, I mean the place my people came from a long, long time ago. The first world. That old country, I see. So who do I want to ask this question? I'm wondering, but who is she? Should I ask him later or should I not ask? He's gonna take another 
down another glass of brandy and then pour himself another one. Might as well tell you. All right. You know, professional networks being what they are, you, you hear of people who can do you certain favors. I've heard of her from a few different sources through the decades. She styles herself Queen Frilla Garba. She's an entity who lives down below, and she's from the old country. She's been here a while, as far as I can tell, and she is willing to do things in exchange for favors. She's very powerful, and I thought maybe she could do a few things for me, which I think she can. It's just I have to deliver to her, you know? Does that name mean anything to me? Does that name mean anything to me? I, I'm pretty sure I know that name. Yes. That would be a secret nature check from Oom. Temerity, this name definitely means something to you. Your friend Nariani often spoke of her lady Frila Garma. Oom, this name means absolutely nothing to you. Never heard it before. When she spoke of her lady, what was I able to get from that? That she was beholden to her in some way? That her lady was like her her patron or what? You tell me, do you want to have asked her about it in detail? Yeah, definitely. You know, if they periodically over the years would meet up and hang out in the woods and party with the satyrs or have tea or whatever, I would think that over the years, he would periodically like ask some questions about her, especially given that I'm sure she was mentioned like in her tales and everything. So if she, well, if she was invoked in whatever way, he would have eventually gotten as much information as seemed reasonable to ask for, not like pushed, but just been like, okay, so what's up with that? She would have spoken about Frilagarma. There's the, my lady Frilagarma. Though you would have gotten a sense that it's like half a joking title and half a very serious one. Like maybe something that started out as more of a an in-joke between friends and drifted into something with a little bit more distance. Though she never said that explicitly, it's just you would have gotten that sense. She would have told you that she and Frila Garma have known each other for a long, long time, even more time than you could easily understand, and that they have been very close with each other for a lot of that time. And that where Frila Garma goes, Narayani wanted to follow. Okay, noted. I don't know if I'm gonna say anything about that at this point. I do have another question. The assumption here is that Frila Garma is like some sort of fate entity? Yes. Okay, 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 okay. What, what did you promise her? Oh, I mean, a few things here and there, and then it just kept s snowballing. I, I promised her that I would do my best to help sort things out with the deep gnomes. They and Frila Garma have some kind of long, ongoing thing that I don't really understand or care about, but I told her I'd do my best to help her smooth it over with them, and I told them I'd do my best to help them deal with her, and now it's all the mess. And then, well, the more information she would give me, the more, the higher the price was, and, and now she says that she knows the secret to why our kindred don't bleach, and they won't tell me anything about it, despite the fact that I have put them up in extremely good lodgings for quite some time now, and given them access to a great deal of research from our point of view. Some people are just difficult, you know? So, in order to get her to tell me, she wants something called the Sword of Time. Now, 
what that is, I have no idea. Nobody here has any idea. She may have made it up for all I know. Is that something that I have ever heard of in any kind of legends from my mom or history lessons? Or do I need to make an arcana check? Like, what do you got for me? I think that would be nature. Nature. Can I roll anyway? <laughs> you can roll anyway. I would also let you roll Draconic Lore. Should I, should I tell I you my modifier? Or Okay. Yeah, if you tell me your modifier, I'm happy to roll it for you. Temerity, this name doesn't ring a bell. It just this term sort of time, not really. Plus seven for Draconic Lore. Um, it sounds very familiar to you. It sounds like a name that was a little bit unusual for a Draconic name. That is one of the names given to you by Mankare. A name that seemed almost more like a title in some way. Yeah, but when there's clear, Mankare called Um the sort of time? No. No, oh. no, no. It's, oh. it's just a name I, I have. Yeah. yeah I won't it's... say anything. Okay. I would like to perceive Um, please. All right. Let me, let me find your modifiers. Okay. Oh, yeah. No question, you can tell Um is keeping something inside. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Without those reading glasses, the library is open. Kind of <laughs> read. <laughs> yeah. Get out those reading glasses, the library is open. Very well, very well. Okay, so let me, let me, look. What it sounds like you're telling me is that you have taken some of your kindred hostage in exchange for information that, is this information they have re refused to give you or they're telling you that they don't have? They claim they don't have it. Well, okay. Now, from afar, it's certainly possible that they're keeping it from you and that they're keeping it from you because you're holding them hostage. Or it's, it's, very, it's also maybe possible that because your people have been separated for so long, if this is not an affliction that they experience, it's not something that they are avoiding it's something that you are all potentially prone to that they are immune to so like it never happens there it only happens to those of your people who moved to to this plane of existence or to the surface on this plane of existence so it's entirely possible that they don't even know you know you you developed a common cold that they don't even get down there have you considered this his whole frame just sags in on itself, and he stares sadly into his glass of brandy. They, there has to be a reason. It can't just be another dead end. Okay, well, there's, there's a lot of questions as to how you got from, you know, zero to to a hostage situation. That's neither here nor there. I believe what I understood from some of the other things that you said was that you told her that you would like help her parlay with them, but you told them that you would help them overtake her or what exactly did you promise to everybody? What, what were the words that you said? What was the terms of the contract, my friend? Puts his head in his hands. It's just enough. Temerity. Do you think I've become that guy? Well, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit worried. Yes, like, I, I believe that you have very noble intentions here. But I think that maybe you were fo so focused on them that I think maybe you focused so hard on the end justifying the means 
that you have stopped to look at the means that you are using. It's hard being a king. I love it, don't get me wrong. I was, I was made for this. Sometimes things just get away from you, you know, and you're like, how did I wind up making this series of decisions? And now I've got to make even more of them. So, what I said, they, they have some kind of long, ongoing cold war that sometimes heats up. I told them that I would help them gather intel on her and provide them with resources that we have here in Brasselwark that could possibly help them defeat her forever. And then I may have told her that I could provide her with resources about gnomes that we have here in Brasselwark that could possibly help her not defeat them forever. They are our people after all, but did it de-escalate things? And well, I haven't, I haven't, you know, paid in full, shall we say? And, and now everybody wants payment? Okay, so you 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 promised them both information to fell the other. Is that is that what I'm getting? Well, fell is a strong word. I, I I told her that I could maybe help you smooth things over culturally or with some magical aid, but I was never planning to give her as much as I was planning to give them because if somebody's gonna come out on top, I would rather it be, you know, our people. Yes, of course. Okay, well, well... I was hoping maybe everything could just be smoothed over, you know? Maybe we all meet up, we have a huge party, they all show up to one of our festivals, and everybody gets along! I know that's a okay. stupid idea, but... Well, here's the thing. Many times in the course of history has a fucking killer party, you know, fixed some deep societal ills. I'm not going to say that that's not the case. But you also have to put in the you have to put in the work to also aid these societal ills. And my concern here is that yes, um, it would be great if maybe you had approached your your kindred a little more gently. I think. Well, take me take me back to how that started. How did they did did, did you invite them and say, oh, come study with me, and you lock them up, or what? How did this go down? Take take me on a walk here. We were introduced through the acquaintance of a friend's friends, colleagues, friends, associates, and, well, I didn't want it to be widely known, after all. You also have a house through to think about, which is kind of my backup plan, because since we have protection from them and from, you know, the may his cloven rest upon you himself, who's gonna charge in here and really try to take us out? Except maybe, and then he, he remembers that Oom is there and is like, So, he, it's a lot of threads, Temerity, a lot of threads at once in my mind. But that's what it takes to be a visionary. So, I invited them here, and uh, we've done some secret collaboration, and at first, you know, they were staying downstairs, completely at their own ease, and they were collaborating with a few of our most trusted academics here, and that happened for several years, maybe a couple decades, and then it seemed things were going well, and then it seemed that they felt they couldn't be of help to us, but I suspected maybe they suspected what I was doing, and that they willfully weren't wanting to help us, and I just feel like they must have some reason so i was like maybe we can all work together here to find out what it is and they were like we just want to go home and you know i thought why not have them stay here a little longer just a little longer to see if we can all find a reason and well now all they do is complain about the lavishly appointed sweets and all the books and the gadgets and the food okay i i see now, you spoke of my mother earlier. You told me how much you admire her. Let's talk about one of the, the most important lessons that my mother instilled in me, which is foresight. You can't have a plan if you don't know how the plan ends. You need to have multiple um, options so that when one potentiality comes into play, then you can, you know, switch to plan D, E, F, G, Z, whatever, right? It seems to me like maybe, maybe you didn't have a plan and maybe instead of 
considering the future and what would happen after you were so focused on the goal that you didn't consider how you're going to dig yourself out from this one. Because step back, my friend. Yes, it's lavishly appointed, but these people want to go home. They're imprisoned. Are they not? Well, that's not a very nice word. No, it's not a very nice thing you've done to them. He just looks like a, like a puppy who realizes that he has done something very bad. There's some way to get out of this. There's some way to get out of everything. But you have to think, you have to think things out, first of all. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I think the, the first thing you need to do is make amends with these, with these people who are your people, as you've stated. You know, in the beginning, you could have figured out how to, how to establish some kind of relations between them and her so that whatever happens, happens. But, you know, like maybe you could have smoothed things over, but this is too complicated now. So right now there's a big knot and we're going to have to like, um, we're going to have to like take a tiny little needle so that we can get those little string and then pull it and pull it and pull it. So yes, I'm going to be here with you to help you. Um, honestly, if you decided to turn around and run the fuck out of here right now, I would understand. And honestly, before he started saying the name of who he was dealing with, I was going to tell you, like, hey, are you sure you even want to hear this? So, like, you know, make your own decisions and understand that if you don't want to be involved in this, I, <laughs> I support you in that decision. But there are people we can help here, right? And he, my friend is one of them, but there are other people that we can help too. How many cups of alcohol am I, am I in right now? Several, and I actually need a fortitude save. I believe that would give you a, a bonus that you probably will not need, <laughs> but good to know. So, you are you are at many cups of alcohol. I think I might non sequitur. <laughs> so, so earlier... There was this thing about about Vrathrian and your past relationship. Kind of want to revisit that because I don't really understand any of this. <laughs> He's just the king is just going to be like, yeah, this guy Temerity met like a long time ago, and they spent some weekend together on a lake somewhere, and it, you know it was good, but then apparently it's not good. I'm gonna look at at Temerity and be like, hey, not judging, but kind of curious. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, you know, sometimes you, in the course of your life and in doing different jobs in different places, you meet people and they seem interesting and they're very handsome and they have a very, like, commanding presence or whatever. And you're like, okay, that's kind of interesting, whatever. You do a job, you, whatever happens, you know, like, blah, 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 you kind of, like, snipe at each other, but it's a little bit sexy, whatever, you know, like, it's... So yeah, like it happened like maybe a few times or, but you know, that doesn't make someone your ex. And honestly, I, you know, I have some thoughts about like, I think he's a little bit too obsessed with me. I think that maybe the whole, re well, you don't even know about this thing of mine that he fucking took, but like, I really think the whole reason that he took it is because he just uh, like, he was so upset that when I said, hey, man, you're doing some really sketchy shit, like, it really, like, he felt judged, and but he was judging himself, and so he, like, lashed out at me and, like, made me his enemy, but secretly, I think that he's, like, he, he wants my approval too much, and that's why it hurts, and that's what I think. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. I'm glad to give you the, the gossip, if that's what you so desire. He... He, I don't think he's a very good guy, but uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased because of all of the shit that I've seen him do over the course of however many years this has been, a decade, a century, a century? Over a century, I don't know. A long fucking time. Does that answer your question? Not really sure I had a specific question, but it certainly tells me a lot. Wait. This guy took something from you? Nobody steals from my friend. I will write him a letter demanding, as king of a city, that he give it back to you. You, you know what, my friend? That is... That's a beautiful thought. But I think right now you're a little bit overextended. 
So perhaps let's resolve the issues you currently have on your plate. It's a very full plate. And then we'll, we'll think about that. You know, he's on the ledger. Dorsey knows all about him. Let the, the letter sounds like a really cool idea. I mean, this guy hurt Ember, and we should make him pay. Well, we will, but you know, we have other shit to do right now. I'll get on that letter. I just want to take us back to a couple of things really quickly. All right, so when I first went to them, I was like, I'll help you. And then I went to her, and I thought, I'm a smooth talker. I've got vision. We'll work it out. It'll all be diplomatic. And then I was like, well, I'll just tell her what she wants to hear for now. And in time, I'll talk her into a reasonable point of view. But it kept spiraling, you know, and, and now we're here. But the thing about your mother, and he's like pretty drunk at this point. That's really wise. It's just, well, honestly, I was just thinking of, you know, Selwynvian. What was her plan? That was one of the things that she busted into, or? Yeah. Can you refresh me, please? She went into a city in the middle of the Mirani forest and took a lot of shit from a, a zone that you could say was a bit of a cold war itself. And she did this all by herself. It was, it was quite a feat. And she was very, very, very proud. And you were very proud of her. And then she returned all these reclaimed artifacts to her people. Come to think of it, she hasn't really been back to Crying Leaf in the years since then. But. Wait. Crying Leaf is where she took it from. It's near where she took it from. Oh, okay, like, so she has she hasn't returned to the area from which she. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> I think part of the plan was don't shit where you eat, man. You know, like yeah, we have we have multiple places to call home, so you know if she if she can't go back there for fifty, seventy, a hundred years, whatever. You know, like okay, big deal. We'll go to the Betterwood. We'll go to to Greengold. But you know, this is this is the place that you. Like you have set up, you have created this, you do, you are connected and you don't want to be separate from it. So like, it's a, it's a little bit different, don't you think? Oh. Well, and also she didn't make any, I don't think she made anybody any deals. She just went in and did what she does. And she didn't really, did she, did she involve other people and machinations and scheming that I'm aware of? Sometimes your mother doesn't share her plans, probably out of an eternal That's instinct true. to keep you safe. So that's probably true. Yeah, you, you didn't know a ton about okay, this operation. So, okay, so I won't say that then. But you know, I'll just be like, you know what? The other thing is, it's a good point that you bring that about because there there were consequences. She can't go back there, you know, for a while. And if she if she wanted to, it would be it would be troublesome for her. Now you don't have the luxury that she has of just laying low because you're the king of the fucking city. So you know. It's it's true that you're very, very smooth and very charming. And it's true that you're you have a very noble intention. But I I think that if you have not before now, you know, stepped back and looked around and like really noticed how deep the hole you continue to have dug yourself is. It seems, it seems like maybe at every point you were like, when you realized that there was something, there were some big shits, like you were like, okay, well, if I dig a little bit deeper, then I can get a little bit further away from the shit. But you didn't think about the fact that you have to eventually get back to the surface. Am I right? Well, I just thought I could make another deal with someone to get me back to the surface. <sighs> you find an air pocket, blows you back up, you know how it is. You know... I, you've, all, you've always been a very lucky man, and I worry for you what happens when your luck runs out. I am going to make this right. I, I'll let them go. Maybe they'll work with you. Maybe you, you should meet, they don't even know you. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Why don't the two of you meet them, and uh, we'll all go from there. 
you know, honestly, I, I actually think that might be the best case scenario. How drunk does Oom look? <laughs> like pretty sure like hiccuping, <laughs> swaying. <laughs> okay. I wonder if it seems like a good idea for us to do this now <laughs> or uh, wait for Oom to sleep this off. I would vote for waiting to sleep it off. I think that's that's probably pretty wise. Okay. You know, I think it's a great idea for us to talk to them. I think that Oom has, has enjoyed your brandy and could maybe use a rest before we take upon such, uh, such a task. And you know, in the morning, it, it, everything's a little brighter in the morning, right? Literally or not literally. And so I think, I think it's a nice way to start the day, to come in and say, hey, something has gotten real fucked up here, but we're going to try to fix it. Yeah, ag agreed. Where is that fellow who was at my observatory with you? Z. Professor Z. Why is he here? with you, if you were with him? Well, we were all trying to go a little bit into, you know, like, uh, take a little bit of a vacation from the city because of how much attention we had drawn ourselves. But because, you know, I had, I had Nami swaddled, it was very cute. So everybody in the street stopped me and they were able to continue going. So, you know, I think he just uh, made it to the woods and probably is blowing something up right now. Good fellow. That's the spirit of Brasselwork. We'll send him a message saying I'm not mad anymore in the morning. Alex, I don't know if this was um, in character or not. I remember Alex saying that that Z like really admires the king and like thinks he like thinks he's done something cool and like it's like an, an admirable figure. I don't remember if that was in character or not. Alex, do you recall? I think it was in character, but I don't remember. Okay. I think there have been a couple moments when Z got at something like that in character. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. You know, even though we've just become friends, I'm very fond of Z. I, I think he I think he has something very special. And when you send when you when you send your message to him. You know, make it a little bit, um, uh, put, put a little admiration in it. He's, he's a great fan of yours, and he, I think that he could really use the, the boost that it would give him to know that the king knows who he is and knows his work, because I think he's working on, you know, I think he has some, I think he has some interesting things going on in there, and a little encouragement can't do any bad for anybody, right? You are so right, Temerity. These are the ways you should be using your power. These to empower other people. You know, think about this. So Is he it... really thinks that much of me. He does. I barely know him, and I've heard him talk of you. Well, he has excellent taste. Then I will write him a glowing letter. If you like him, then I like him. Is it more or less ominous if we say we're alive and doing well? I think that if Z is is being given his flowers, so to speak, I'm not sure he would even notice if it was ominous or not, you know? It could say, like, we killed your friends, but you, you're working on something great, and I'm not sure, you know, like, I don't mean that as a judgment either, like... No, you're probably right. He has a very good outlook, and it's very positive, and it's focused on, on the good things. So for him, the good things are the discoveries and the work that he can do. So even if, even if there was something horrible amiss, that he would, he might miss it just because of the good stuff that he's focusing on. You know? Yeah. All right. And the the potential explosions. I think. I'll make sure he gets word in the morning. I'll show you some nice rooms upstairs, not downstairs, and then we can all sleep it off, make a fresh start. And he's going to open the office door and gesture you into the hallway and will lead you to two also very, very lavish guest suites. Incredibly comfy beds and pillows, ornately carved beds, probably have like canopies and curtains and, and such. And 
will be able to have a very sound sleep should you wish to do so in the home of King DTF. Let's leave things there for now. Everybody, finally, after a very, very long fire day, getting some much needed rest and having some answers and probably many, many more questions about everything going on. How are your characters feeling right now as we wind down? Ember is very tired and Justin is very sad because I forgot that Ember only heals two hit points on a full night's rest. I'll just burn you again. That sounds good. So yeah, he's, he's very exhausted from a full day of fighting and he's happy to, you know, be somewhere kind of cozy. He's worried that, you know, but he trusts that, that friend Temerity is good at sneaking. Temerity is, there's a lot going on. Temerity did not, Temerity had like a sip and was like, let me, I need my faculties about myself to listen to all of this goddamn best. And he, he truly believes that his friend can turn this around in some way, whether that's a way that, that he's going to survive. I don't, I, I don't know, but turn it around in such a way that he can fix the fact that he has, he has imprisoned some people in very nice digs in his castle. You know, like he can at least make some, he can right the ship in some ways. If it crashes into the Fey realm, that's another matter. But like what's happening in this realm is something that we kind of need to focus on in this moment. What's happening in this castle, we need to focus on. And then we can expand out from there. I think that's where Temerity's at. But also probably taking another bath because you never, like when you have the facilities available, you must use them. He's He's been sleeping on the road in dirt for so long that he's like, let me just, let me just soak. Let me just make myself a crown of bubbles. That's what's going on. Z is definitely tired and wanted to just have a regular camping trip, not be attacked by a giant bat. A little bit awkward about this person who has taken them in, but not anything beyond that. And, and yeah, ready, ready for a regular night's sleep. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um is any less confused now after having talked more and learned more. I think tipsy and I think probably focusing more on the Rothrian plotline because it's more easily understood than the, the other stuff that's floating around about, you know, forced vacations and permanent imprisonment. I will keep that in mind as I think about the next time we're all together. As always, thank you all so much for being here. It's always a delight to be your GM and to watch everything you get up to and to tell this story with you. And thank you to everyone watching and listening for being our audience and for being in this story with us. Thanks so much for joining us this episode and for being in this story with us. We really appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel welcome to let us know by leaving us a comment, liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and telling your friends about us, or any combination of the above. You can follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Chromythica, and visit us on the web at chromythica.com. Our character art and logos, credits and break music, and some theme music are by Justin Brown. Chromythica uses trademarks and copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. used under Paizo's community use policy, which you can access at paizo.com slash community use. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Chromythica is not published, endorsed, or specifically approved by Paizo. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until we're together again, remember, Tell the stories you most want to encounter in the world.